NZR Aero Sports, Icarus Canopies, now Gyro. That's right, we've rebranded, and Gyro is our next generation. It honours our founder, as that's the name we knew him by, but Gyro also marks the start of a new chapter. And not to be biased, but it's going to be fucking epic. Long story short, we're more us than ever. So if you're new to the sport, or even a Sky God Ninja Turtle, welcome. I think our valiant leader Lucy, Gyro's daughter, Says it best. And we still got that fuck your attitude. <laughs> Rebrand! Woo! Rebrand woo indeed, Lucy. Anyway, head over to gyro.com for more info and get amongst your legends. I was 19, broke, unemployed, and sold my girlfriend's canopy for drug money. So, I thought I'd better sew her a new one. What a sentence, and what a story. This describes the humble yet outrageous beginnings of NZ Aerosports, the home of Icarus Canopies, in the words of our founder himself. From getting a paratrooper toy from his mom, watching parachutes at the DZ as a six-year-old, jumping off the wharf with a parachute made from bedsheets, doing his first jump at 16, sewing his first canopy on a borrowed machine at 19, and starting to sell parachutes out of a garage in 1986, Paul Gyro Martin had an undying love for the sky. Our company started with one man with the wildest of spirits in a true blue sky dream, a renegade. In the time that Gyro created and ran the Icarus Canopies brand until he passed away in 2017, he pushed everything he had to its limits. We miss him and we always will. Gyro is the next generation of NZ Aerosports. It honors our founder, of course, because it was the name we all knew him by, but Gyro the rebrand also marks the start of a new chapter, our next jump. Gyro is the space between sound and silence, art and science, chaos and calm. Gyro is a state of epic tranquility that transcends understanding. That moment, in the door, in free fall, mid-swoop, where nothing but the present exists. A perfect balance of euphoria and thrill. Gyro captures our passion for flying and our commitment to designing break-the-fucking-rules canopies that deliver pilots pure, wild flight. Hey gang, so... I got a new book out. It's called The Upside of Fear, and it's exactly what you think it's about. It's about the good side of, well, getting scared. In it, we talk not only about the science and biology behind fear, but the psychology as well. And it's not just coming from me. It's coming from some of the best in the sport. Omar Al-Hijalan, Jeff Provenzano, Maxine Tate, and so many more have contributed their sometimes terrifying stories to the book to help you overcome your fear. So head to the lunaticfringepodcast.com. You're going to find the link to the book there as well as the other books. It's available in ebook, paperback, hardback, and audiobook right now. Coming straight from the cockpit, it's another episode of Lunatic Fringe with the fucking pilot. Ready, set, go! Back in the can for another edition of the Lunatic Fringe Podcast. And we're talking to somebody I've actually got quite a lot in common with, even though she's just getting started in her career. Tell me, who the fuck are you and what do you do? My name is Candice. I jump out of Skydive City in Zephyr Hills, and I had the absolute goal to come on the show as an a licensed skydiver, just starting out. And that's pretty much all I'm doing right now. You're kind of a shiny, brand new penny in the box. (laughs) Yeah, but I'm loving it. I'm loving it. And I want to share it with other people who are new in the sport and hear about all the time how everybody started when they were really young. And I'm starting at 42. Yep. You know, I have I have time to make up for, but I love it and it can be done. 
Well, we we introduced or we got introduced because you sent me a message going, "Hey, asshole." <laughs> Like you're you're not representing fucking people getting started middle age. To which I shot back, eh, kind of. I've had a few people that that started out in middle age, but you are right. The majority of the people that are lifers in the sport tend to get started pretty young, and their stories are super inspirational. They're amazing, incredible stories, and a lot of great information. But I found myself always digging through, and I'm embarrassed to say that I would sit there for probably 30 minutes and and just dig through and try to find, tell me what it was like in the beginning and make this normal for me, because I think I'm just fucking it up worse than anybody else has ever fucked it up before. <laughs> tell me somebody was as bad as I am. <laughs> well, that's the funny thing, right? Is even if you were the worst ever, there's still some instructor out there that's going to go, I can fix her. Well, yeah, and um, there's half the guys, the swoopers on the drop zone that see you come in as a girl and they think they can fix you too. <laughs> sure, sure. So uh, outside of jumping out of airplanes, what's, what was day-to-day -day life before you went out and jumped out of an airplane? Like, who are you? What do you do for work? What's the, the home life? What's all that? Uh, that's probably why I got started. Uh, work life is super boring shit online and... Um, my kids are grown now and I started out super early with kids. Uh, all I wanted to do when I was younger was to be a pilot. So I've always been drawn to the air. Mm. My dad, F100 Super Sabres. And wow. I grew up, it was kind of, I didn't realize it was unique at the time. Um, but I grew up just on every weekend I was flying around in his Cessna or his Cardinal. And uh, I just knew I wanted to be a pilot. That's all I ever wanted to do. Um, and then I ended up pregnant in high school. So kind of well, put the next. That would change course on things a little bit. Yeah, in a big way. And I didn't really plan any backup from there. Like, I well, had... the, what fucking high school student plans a backup for if you have a kid in high school? <laughs> yeah. No, my parents were super proud of me. <laughs> uh... <laughs> So, yeah, so I found myself being a stay-at-home mom for a long time and then working in the construction business, and uh, I've always worked in a male-dominated field. So, But now my kids are grown, and I, I was faced with asking myself for the first time in my life, the scariest question in my life, what do I want to do? Mm. Now what? And that's well, Especially when from such a young age, it wasn't just about you anymore. I mean, I say I was young when I became a dad, but I was 27. I mean, that's still an adult, granted a fucking moron, but still an adult. So starting out in high school, and I was I, I was curious because in that first message when we spoke, um, you had said that you're 42 and have a bit of empty nest syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I tried doing the math. I'm like, what do you mean empty nested? Really? <laughs> Wait a second. That's, that's, that's young. But now I understand. Yeah. I mean, I, for my 19th birthday, I was in the hospital having my first son and all I got for my birthday was a crappy piece of cake. Like that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Wow. Yeah. So, that's that. Yeah. And then I went on to, uh, I, I always joke around that I've just been force gumping my way through life. Like I just yep. end up on side journeys and, and side quests and I, I just keep dumbing my way through it. And somehow I end up doing some pretty cool shit. So um, I have ridden horses my whole life and I've been involved in the equine industry since I was six, uh, raised my kids, hanging out, doing that stuff in rodeo Um Broke my neck in two places. Didn't find out for two years that I had broken my neck. So that was fun. Um, and then they told me that there was way too much going on for them to fix. I was, was not a candidate for disc replacement. Like I was basically just going to have to deal with it. Sure. <clears throat> or get fully fused. So that took me out of that. And then all the while I have the same horse vet, my equine vet, who is a skydiver. And I thought he was nuts. And he has been my vet for 18 years and finally talked me into it. I don't know how he talked me into it, but uh, God, I thought I was the most terrified tandem student ever when I showed up. I saw everybody like around me was doing their interviews with Chris Stubbs down there at Skydive City. And they're excited and laughing. And I am shitting my pants. 
I do not want, I don't know what to say. I'm not laughing in my interview. And he says, no, why do you want to skydive? Why skydive? And I was like, uh, cause what else was I doing? That was the best answer I could come up with. But I went and, uh, today the same, the same tandem instructor is my coach today. So pretty I kind of, cool, right? hmm? pretty cool, right? It is cool. It is cool. So he's gotten to see my progression from there. And I, I won't say it's a lot of progression. Well, so you go out and, and uh, as a, as a retired tandem instructor, I've seen students like you a thousand times that are just, you can see they're kind of on autopilot. Like part of them is just fucking checked out. Um, <laughs> and it's not, it's funny because it's not a fear of death or a fear of anything. It's just fear. It's just a, yeah. whoa, I'm in zero control of anything that's going on. But the flip side of that coin is those people, when they land, have achieved something that the people that the bubbly people that just bounce their way onto the airplane and don't seem to have too much trouble with it all. They don't achieve something that you achieve. It's true. And that's, I think what has been, I know has been the part that has kept me coming back every single time. Yep. Uh, because not coming back is even scarier. Sure having that regret is even scarier. It's funny though, right? Because you're like, I wasn't terrified when I went out and made my first jump, but I, I was relieved when it was finally done. Cause I had a bunch of weather and mechanical issues that kept postponing the jump. So it just kept building and building and building. But I found that as I went further through my course, uh, and even once I was a licensed skydiver and continuing on, the fear factor was something I had to contend with every single time I got in the car to drive to the drop zone. And you're on the way out there going, what the fuck am I doing? What, why am I going back out there? But you keep your foot on the accelerator and you still go, even though you can't explain why in the hell you're doing it. And I argued with myself every time. I, I can't tell you how many stories I've come up with in my head as to why I couldn't show up that day or how was <laughs> tell my friends how do I tell my coach who am I disappointing and but then I'd find myself around friends and family who don't skydive that were seeing a change in me mm. and a, I would speak about it positively and and that kept me going because obviously nobody's making me do this right it is nobody's got a gun to your head forcing you to to go fail your cat C for a second time and come back and try for a third sure so well, and there's also when you're dealing with people that don't jump and don't know anything about the sport and all they know is that, holy shit, that's crazy. Like, there's something really attractive about being labeled that kind of crazy, right? You're like, yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. People who know me are not terribly surprised that I ended up in skydiving. Um, but it kind of a unique, interesting story is that I raised my kids in Zephyr Hills, so those ball fields that you're you're jumping over that you're flying your canopy over i was the t-ball mom down there hmm. yeah try try keeping it's like herding cats when you have a bunch of canopies overhead and a bunch of five-year-olds who are not trying to pay attention so and i remember always looking at him and going you guys aren't doing that i'm not doing that they're crazy and that's pretty much the attitude i had for so many years and i i have a friend of mine who's trying to to convince me and spent 18 years trying to convince me and I, I finally gave in <laughs> and I'm it's, so glad it's so funny too because and and you'll find this you're still quite new in the sport but you'll find yourself gravitating more towards people that are that kind of crazy and you still have friends that aren't jumpers but you find that there's differences between you and the friends that don't jump that you never recognize before <laughs> It's true. It's almost like you, you know, that it's, it's knowing that somebody else went through the same thing and had mm. to go in the trenches of their mind and come out. And I joke around all the time that I had to fight for every step of the way. Yeah. It did not naturally to me. I didn't go too crazy, like nothing dangerous, but I've had more than a few instructors tell me, Oh, I've seen worse. <laughs> <laughs> Which it was the the thing is, and the thing that you try and explain to people about skydiving and, and you try and explain this to people outside the sport is that the physical act of skydiving is very simple. 
Like there's not that much to it. Learning how to become a licensed skydiver and flying on your belly and opening a parachute and even knowing how to deal with the emergencies, it's not that complex. We're not programming computers here. It's not that that's the difficult part. The difficult part is putting your fucking underwear on and your socks on <laughs> to go out and make that jump, right? It's it's not the jump itself. It's the mental um, gymnastics that are required to go, okay, let's go jump out of a fucking plane. Today, yeah. Not, yes. not days and stress about it for 48 hours beforehand and force yourself to keep going. And that is where I started listening to the podcast. And that is the only way I kept making it there. I thought if I'm going to do this, I have to hear from other people who have been here before. And it was very reassuring to me um, because in that moment, I, I'm, I've never experienced anything like it facing and confronting down fear in such a way and yeah. having to then face down what I was afraid of because I wasn't afraid of dying. I, I wasn't worried something terrible was going to happen to me. I was afraid of failing. Sure. Really. I was afraid of screwing it all up. And I remember having this moment when I finally threw AFF and I'm going out towards, you know, GH and going on. And somebody finally said to me, you know, they're just trying to prove to you, show you, you can get unstable and then get restable. And I said, well, could somebody have told me that? Uh, <laughs> you're being tested and the yep. whole time they just want to see you get out of your own fuck up and out of your own head. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I Going back all the way to, to my AF, of course, when I got to the instability jump, you're supposed to do a backflip. And I land and I'm doing the debrief with Bruce, my instructor at the time. And he's all, and that was the be most beautiful front flip I've ever seen. <laughs> I had no fucking clue. All I know is that shit wasn't right. And then I arched out of it. Right. And, but you're so completely out of it, but that's all they want to see is that you know how to pull your head out of your ass and, and get the parachute open. But they kind of, I suppose it depends on the instructor. Some of them like to see people have to work through that kind of stuff themselves. And others are all, look, I just want to make sure that you can get back to stable. But yeah, it's, it's and, tough. And nothing prepares you for how disorienting it is at first and, and all those steps through it. And, you know, I hate to see, you know, there's been some students that have come and then I just don't see them show back up again and they kind of quit. And that's a bummer because really on the other side of this big black hole is like rainbows and butterflies, but you don't, you can't see it. You don't know that. And if you can just push yourself and I'll tell you there's breathing exercises and then there's weird things that I did in the plane on the way to altitude. And one of them was <laughs> the most obnoxious. I started singing pocket full of sunshine. I don't know where it came from. I don't even like the song. <laughs> and I'm on the airplane and I have to say I was blessed with a great group of instructors just awesome people and um they kept me going and I start singing this stupid song but like on repeat in my head <laughs> but I'm sure I'm irritating the shit out of everybody and we get to the ground and I pass that level and they started playing the song and the instructors are singing it and it was just a really cool moment and so now I'm kind of stuck with this stupid song for life pretty much but but it worked but yeah. it worked it was able i was able to un unmind fuck myself sure well that's the thing right is so uh skydivers inherently uh have an amazing understanding of what a newer jumper is going through because even though it's a different version of what they went through we still see somebody wrestling with demons like mm -hmm. it's fucking obvious you're looking over and going oh this one's putting up a fight holy shit you know and and i've i've seen it for years and years and even when i transitioned out of being a tandem instructor and an aff instructor and i'd be flying once in a while you get a refusal that ends up going back down with the plane and it's kind of a, a is obviously a warped sense of humor after you've been in the sport for a while, but it would always joking would be, Oh, well, there's lifelong regret right here coming down. And, you know, and, oh. uh -huh. and it is, but it is, you know, I mean, as joking as it is, I guarantee you for every person I've ever seen refuse a jump and never go back and do it again. That is something they will think about for the rest of their lives without a doubt. 
Absolutely. And to your point, I had that moment and, uh, at, well, there was two super cool moments, um, that happened to me in the loading area. One of them, the crappier version was there was just a lot of cloud cover. And, and in fact, they were, they were going for a world record that day. All the big top names in the sport are all there right next to me, me and my dorky, you know, pro tech helmet and the, and the whole deal and all of these incredible people. And they actually didn't go up because there was too much cloud cover. I went up, looked down and I told my instructor, you know, I'm not comfortable. I feel like if I put myself in a position to freak myself out right now, this may be the thing that undoes me. And sure. I made place and the pilot high fived me and said, you know, I, I respect that, you know, so, but I made, I stand by my decision to ride the plane down, but that feeling in the pit of my stomach was a thousand times worse yeah. landing. Plane. And I knew I couldn't live with that. If I ever quit, I, that would be far worse than anything that happens in the sky. See how fucked up is that and wonderful at the same time that like-minded people that generally get into skydiving, the idea of refusing to uh, raise to the challenge is worse than fucking going in. <laughs> I'd li I would literally rather die than back down from the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Because we all are going to be on our deathbed one day and I don't want that shadow person that I could have been standing there looking at me, you know, oh, yeah. saying could have been this it's but it's you, always the flash to the the brave heart speech yes if you don't fight today you'll live the rest of your lives but in your bed when you're dying it's that it really is and i've i've actually had the opportunity to speak to people that uh, um refused whether it be on that day or bumped into them and i'm like are you going to give it another shot and you can just instantly see the regret in their eyes that they went down and i mean i've seen it ruin relationships like on the spot because one refused and one didn't. And you're like, oh, God, man, this is, this is, it's big shit. Oh, yeah. I heard that story. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Cool. I, I mean, it's a great story for me for the rest of my life, but I guarantee that dude is never going to live it down ever, ever, ever. Learned an input. Maybe he learned an important lesson that day, but I will say it's, it's awesome. And I, I you know, I've been in other sports and this is not to, now, I'm probably going to hopefully nobody hears this part of it, but um, from the horse community, they're assholes at the top of the sport. There's a lot of them that really treat newcomers like shit. And Skydiving is just the polar opposite of that. Sure. And so the cool story, I know I told you about it um, briefly. I'm in I'm in the loading area and this is the moment that I felt like this is it. I can't do this. And the only thing I had to make a choice on was whether or not I just run or do I tell my instructor first? Like, I'm, I can't do this. This is like my second cat D or something. It's when it really start, you get asked to do different things and you're not quite comfortable and you're by yourself. And that's really kind of our hill, you know, when sure. going through. And God love him. The instructor I was with, he's showing me puppy videos and trying to get me out of my head <laughs> yeah yeah um and singing pocket full of sunshine it's nothing's working nothing's working and I stand up and I turn around and there's this beaming smile looking back at me and um it air wax is right behind me uh Karen how do you say your last name Joy okay yeah it's just beaming this smile at me that is so reassuring. She could read my mind, see what was happening. And she was standing in between me and my exit to get <laughs> out of the loading area. And I thought, I would have to walk past these people if I quit. I am not, hell no. But I realized it was International Women's Day. There's all these incredible women around me. And they are all so very supportive. Everybody's high-fiving me. They can tell I'm freaking out. And I had a great jump after that. And I passed my next, next level and I'm so grateful. But you never know what kind of impact you're going to have on somebody. I could have mm. quit that day. And there's it's such big ambassadors for the sport out there. And in those tiny moments, that changed my day 100%. Sure. Well, and it's also uh, at learning. I'm sure you learned after the fact who she was. Um, uh-huh. 
So to <laughs> learn after the fact, oh, wait, she's a world champion, like the best of the best ambassador to the sport, complete badass. It's 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 kind of funny because the first time that I met Greg and Karen, um, I, I had I talked to them online a bit, trying to get them on the show and everything. And and we did a show online, but then I did the second time I had them on the show. I had them in person when I was in my studio in Dubai. And even me at the time, I think I was probably 24, 25 years in the sport and 10, 11,000 jumps. And I've got Airwax bringing me a fucking bottle of French wine. And we're sitting in my shitty little studio having this great conversation. And even I'm like, holy shit, this is fucking cool, you know? And it really is. And that's that to your point of of the um, the top of the sport in skydiving, by and large, tend to be the people that are most willing to reach out and help. Yeah. Yeah. And they have humility. I mean, I mean, confidence and humility go hand in hand, really. Um, and uh, yeah, it was even even better than um, to make to top off that day. I come off and this my first. The, I think it was the next day I had my first off radio landing and I landed right on the airport. And what's terrible is that I thought that I was a badass. Like I was like, I don't know why they talk about landing being so hard. I got this. No, bitch, you have a radio. <laughs> like, Makes a difference. So, yeah. So I make this terrible landing. And in that moment, um, I come back over and I go have a beer at the bar. Like it's been a rough day. And um, there's some folks talking and guy says, hey, I want to introduce you to somebody. And it's Jeannie Bartholomew. And I'm like, Oh, I got to have the worst canopy day and now talk to her. <laughs> Just keeps getting better. But she was so awesome, too. She told me her story about how, you know, she was told she was never going to be a good canopy pilot. And now look at her. Yeah. So. Yep. It's honestly, it's it's uh, um, it's a case of beside the fact that skydiving is a very small community and um if you don't know someone, you know, 10 people that do know that person. So it, it, you get to know the community and get accepted by the community incredibly quickly. But it's also because it's um, it's a sport that doesn't have a huge upside and that there's no Tiger Woods of golf. You know, the best in the in the business are not making $50 million. You know, we're all doing this because we love doing it. And there's a dramatic difference between that and those incredibly high paid athletes or uh, with, um, with horseback riding and stuff. You're also talking about an incredible financial investment. And I hate to say it, but money fucks stuff up. The more money that's involved and the richer the people are at the top of the chain, chances are the less I'm going to have in common with them. And mm -hmm. And that's not always the case. I know very wealthy people that are really fucking cool, but I also know some real pricks with a lot of money. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. And that goes to their personality, but it also goes to kind of, you get some dirty stuff going on and, and, you know, it can sports getting too, too terribly big and, and too many hands in the pot can make a difference. Sure. But for me, what I've seen in such a short time is, is just the fact that when you have to, confront fear in such a unique way and and confront yourself in such a unique way I think that almost is what I observed at least because <laughs> who am I it, but like a brotherhood in in that in that oh, arena very much so it's it's uh, I've likened it to the whole mentality of of uh, um uh, the foxhole mentality is you become incredibly yeah. close incredibly quickly. And it's not the whole death defying thing. I don't think that's part of it because I honestly believe skydiving to be an incredibly safe sport. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the fear, fear, yeah. fear and danger are two separate things. They're two very different things. Like you can be terrified of something that can't kill you, or you can not have any fear of something that'll fuck you up real quick. So it's, it, it, they are not the same, but every skydiver has had to, to some degree overcome fear. And every skydiver has to, had to deal with being humbled almost every step of the way. So believe me, the the first time you're off radio with a fucked up landing, not to to uh, put a damper on it, but you got a lot more humbling coming your way. 
<laughs> oh, oh, absolutely <laughs> do. I mean, I, an instructor asked me if I was drilling for oil. I mean, I still, <laughs> I'm, when I tell you, I've never had a good exit ever. And I'm okay with that. I just keep going. <laughs> keep going because there's no failure greater to me than quitting. Sure. So just keep going with it. And, and I am fortunate to have really good people around me. Um, and of course now I'm trying to talk my friends into it. So of course. well, now. one of the, one of the great joys too, is at the point that you're at right now, you are a newly licensed skydiver, you know how to not die, which makes right everything so fun because those shitty exits they that's not the end of the world and you finally realize that as a licensed skydiver you realize i know how to get stable so if i don't pull this exit off i'm still skydiving it doesn't it doesn't matter it's not a oh my god i might die because i don't know what comes next so now for you it's kind of all icing it's just tasty now it's just the fun stuff and and continuing to get better and um I will continue to have coaching and do it as best I can the right way. But I think one of the things is, is when we talk about age, I, I mean, I'm not dead, I'm 42, no. but I didn't start super early. And I think there's like that forum I have seen on there. There's quite a lot of us that are starting at this age, but I've seen more of them come and quit than I have in the younger crowd, which is interesting. Which you kind of wouldn't expect, right? I mean, I'd almost right. expect the opposite. I would too, but uh, I think what, well, I think when you're younger too, you just set your mind to it. And you don't really have like all these, you don't have 40 years of fears and failures and, and things that you're looking back at. And, and also you can basically just spend your money all in one place. If sure. You want. Sure. Well, I think the other thing too is that at year 42, I'm almost 55. I also know that a stub toe is going to take me out for two weeks. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, one one uh, lawn dart landing and I might be going, oh, no, fuck, I'm not going to walk right for a month. I don't think I can keep doing this. So we're, we're kind of slightly more aware of the physical um, price to pay. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Um, as well as the, the financial price to pay. But um, I mean, I'm sure I shouldn't tell my neurologist that I'm skydiving. I mean, <laughs> fuck them. On a, I mean, come on. <laughs> when I left there, so I went to one of the best in the country, the Fondren Clinic in Houston, Texas. I used to live in Texas and um, they were a great team. But he said, you know, you're done doing anything you know physical like that. And your, your horse riding career is over. You're done with that. And I cried for probably an hour on the way home. And then suddenly hysterical laughter because it dawned on me. I'm not going to fucking listen anyway. No, no. Well, that's There's the thing, right? I mean, and I get it. I, especially, um, the, the way that, uh, the healthcare and legal system is set up in the States, I understand doctors need to cover their asses. I, and this is somebody that I'm 10 surgeries in and more trips to the hospital than I can count. I get, they need to cover their ass. So I understand when a doctor says you won't be able to do this, that, or the other moving forward. That's him making sure that if he's found in a, a court of law, he can go, look, here, I wrote it down. I told this moron not to do this shit. But yeah. I all, just like you, I'm, no, fuck off. I, if I physically think I'm able to do it, I'm going to do it. You know, I mean, you and I actually, that's another thing you and I have in common I have had two major surgeries on my neck. I have two fused, three fused discs and one fake one. Um, and I'll be damned if anybody's going to tell me what I can and can't do. I physically know my body. And there are so many skydivers listening to this podcast with injuries that doctors told them, took them out of the game. And they're all laughing right now going, yeah, fuck you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. I'm not quitting. No. And I... I I didn't do the fusion because I didn't want to, I was afraid I wouldn't be able to turn left and right. So I've basically just been brawl dog in pain since 2016 when I got in a really bad accident. And I just, I don't, what is my alternative is that they said they were going to fuse the whole cervical spine. And oh, yeah. 
Well, I've only, what have I got? I've got one and two still move free. And then I'm, I'm, I've got one fake disc all the way down to seven. So I've everything fused, but one, um, and it still works. I mean, my head still turns, but fine to me. So maybe I, maybe I should just, you know, go do it. But my fear, you know, was that I'm going to go in there and they're going to do this. And then I won't have an option to do any cool shit anymore. I'll tell you, know? you what the it starts to get and, and all my pain was self-inflicted. This is, you know, years and years and years of shooting video with stupid heavy cameras on top of my head and hard canopy openings and, you know, just being a young idiot. Um, so it was just 28 years of destroying my neck and the pain was getting to the point where I, I couldn't sleep through the night. I'd wake up in the morning with both arms going numb. It was just this downward spiral. And I'm like, this is, I have to do something. Sadly for me, they did the first surgery and then one of, they put in two, um, two implants. So two artificial discs uh, and one of them fucking broke. So but yeah, I broke a titanium disc in my neck. So in four months, uh, yeah, after the surgery. So they had to go in, and that's why I ended up with the extra fusion. But to be perfectly honest, I still wouldn't change having the surgery done just because the day-to-day -day pain gets to be... It gets to be really, really, really rough. In fact, I had to take one week off because of all the crazy shit that I've done, and I've used my body like a crash test dummy. Sure. You know, just doing crazy stuff that I wanted to do. But um, <clears throat> of all the things I've done, I fell asleep on the couch and hit me in for a week. And that's just embarrassing. No, yeah. no, I have a running joke with my, actually my wife told this joke about me the other day. She's like, you don't know what it's like being fucked up until you're like my husband who threw his back out when he sneezed too hard. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty much true. It is, you know, it, but it's, it's kind of one of those things. And honestly, I would recommend for you in, in your case to look into what options you have to maybe not fusing the whole thing, but at least reducing that pain. Cause I mean, when you refer to ibuprofen as vitamin I, maybe, you know, maybe it's going too far, like for years and years, if it wasn't load up on ibuprofen, and when I'm going to bed, and either I'm taking Benadryl to knock me out, or I'm taking an Ambien to knock me out, because oh. the pain just won't let you fall asleep. That's when you know, fuck, something's got to be done. And I think you'll be surprised that there's a lot that they can do, especially with cervical spine that'll still uh, keep you jumping. Yeah, because that's definitely the goal. I just don't want anything to to limit me and my ability to to do anything I want to do, really. But uh, yeah, like you, I, I was taking those goodies powders, and I think I was up to eight of them a day, which is definitely not recommended. Not good, no. And I did this for three years, and I thought I'm I'm gonna rupture my stomach, like I'm I'm gonna die because I'm in pain. Yeah. Um, but you know they when. I was 34 when I went in there and they said, you've got a whole lot more going on and we can't replace your disc. You're just not a candidate. So he said, you've got the neck of like an 85 year old. I was like, sweet. Well, see that would, uh, especially considering you had that check done at 34. Uh, now I think it would be worth revisiting, but it all depends. Like they told me the same thing, like uh, these two discs you're not candidates for replacement because you've got arthritis going on in the disc now because of all the damage and stuff. And, but the, the, and this is something you'll learn, especially as you continue on in your skydiving career is every skydiver out there becomes a keyboard orthopedic surgeon. Like <laughs> I know more about fucking joints and bones than I ever thought I would. And that's just cause I fucked them all up. But so it turns out most of the rotation of your head takes place in the top two vertebrae. So they can fuse yep. all the rest of that shit and you're still going to be able to turn your head. If they fuse all of it, well, I mean, then, <laughs> yeah. But, then, but the idea of not being in pain, like, I don't even know what that's like. I just walk around at like a six or seven every day and that's normal. Yep. <laughs> so. yep. Well, after I had my second surgery, the recovery was pretty brutal, but it finally started backing down. But because the neck pain started going away, I started noticing all the other shit that hurt. 
<laughs> I'm like, oh, fuck. Well, my neck doesn't hurt anymore. Now my shoulder is killing me. Now this is going on. That's going on. So it's just uh, there's going to be an ice pack on me somewhere most of the time. Yeah. And you know what? I have noticed that openings actually help that trap nerve. And I'm probably <laughs> convincing myself of this. I swear it helps. I'm um that's what we're going with though. Well, that's I mean, again, I've been at it a, a bit longer than you, but I've had openings that cracked every fucking vertebrae from my neck to my ass, and I convinced myself that it was just like going to the chiropractor. That's where I'm at. That's where yeah, I'm at. Yeah. No, no. Hey, I'll let you live with that delusion. Enjoy it. It's great. <laughs> it's a great place to be. Now, we didn't talk about it, but uh, um, so you're an empty nester, which means there's uh, kids running around out there. What do they think that uh, mom's out jumping out of airplanes? Do they think you lost your shit because you're because uh, they left? Oh, gosh. So uh, the younger one, they're both very supportive. I'm, I'm lucky that they're both supportive. They think it's kind of crazy my youngest has come out to the drop zone once so that's cool um he may come on a tandem this summer my older son absolutely not he is he is supportive um he's he's always seen me do crazy stuff so uh he's been supportive my mom on the other hand i, I know we talk about a lot whether or not we told our parents before mm. um I did not. I did not. It was not until about a month in, she thought that I wasn't speaking to her. She thought I was mad at her. So I had to tell her, no, mom, I've just been really busy. Um, and her answer, super not supportive at all. Her answer to me when I leave is, is okay, don't die. Thanks, yeah. mom. Yeah. Thanks. That's, uh, but that's the extent of, uh, of the family support, but my kids have been great. My kids have been great. Well, I mean, and I hate to say it, but family again is a secondary concern when you want to go jump out of airplanes. It's true. It's true. I'd be super stoked if one of my sons decided to do it. Um, but there's no, I don't have to worry about a spouse telling me not to do it. Sure. So that's something I don't have to contend with. I've kind of run the gamut in that area escaped a couple <laughs> <laughs> well hey if uh if you didn't escape them uh beforehand trust me scott having weeds them out pretty quick <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely it's and it's it's there. very difficult for anyone outside of skydiving to cope with the amount of time energy and passion that we're willing to put into the sport and anybody that can't cope with not being the you know centerpiece of someone's life is not going to work with a skydiver. And I feel like it's very polarizing. It would be on a relationship because either they're going to be supportive of you being passionate about something, but that goes for anything. I mm. mean, I mean, really anything that you want to be really good at, you have to go full bore into it. Sure. Absolutely. Well, and it's like my my wife, for instance, um, she doesn't jump. She's gone out and done a tandem skydive and uh, she had fun with it. It was uh, neat for her to check it off the box. But I mean, she's also someone that shit her pants when I took her on a ride along flight in the Twin Otter. Like I had to rip the headset off of her head because she was screaming so loud. I thought my ears were bleeding. So <laughs> But that's actually one of the things that made me want to continue dating her back then because I'm like, oh, okay, she's not going to want to be part of this part of my life. This will still just be for me. And that was kind of nice. You know, Which is there is there is an even mix, but uh, especially when you're at your point in a skydiving career, there's skydiving and then there's everything else. You know, I'm at the point where I can have a happy medium for everything. Yeah, for me, it's it's my shiny new toy, and I it's gonna keep me from getting any more bad relationships in the bag. So that's fantastic for me. Wait, um, you're, wait you're on a drop zone now. <laughs> you might want to take that back. <laughs> but, but in this realm, and I can I know how to say no. <laughs> Because you're now in a sport where chances are the coolest guy on the drop zone lives in a trailer somewhere in the woods. <laughs> I'm just saying, that's not a bad thing. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I will say, and I've heard all the things about it. I've even heard the stories of, you know, I saw a girl asking about on Reddit. Um, 
or a guy that my girlfriend's a skydiver, but she doesn't want me to come to the drop zone. Is that an issue? Yeah. I was going to tell him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, it was the same with, with uh, people used to ask with my daughter um, when she was younger if I wanted to uh, go out and make a skydive. And my response was always, as long as she doesn't have to go to a fucking drop zone to do it. Um, yes. <laughs> The funny thing is the culture now has changed dramatically. Like it's not like it used to be when I started. It was um a bit more wild west and and uh, uh definitely more uh incestuous within the sport. Not to say that it isn't now. It's still pretty big party. First, I mean obviously when you're dealing with passions that run as high as they can doing something like jumping out of an airplane, obviously it's a pretty charged environment and it always will be. But it's a bit more professional than it used to be back in the day. Absolutely. And and you stole the words out of my mouth. It, it, it's like when I hear the stories, you guys started in the Wild West. You got we are babied. <laughs> Even we are babied. We're all jumping out of twin otters on brand new gear. And, you know, it's not like it was. And you guys were wild back then. And it, it not that it isn't today, but I get a much milder form, which is probably good for me, um, <laughs> especially at 42 and not running around. Or maybe it would have been worse for me when I was younger. I'm not sure. Well, it's kind of funny because, I mean, I, I hate to say it because it sounds so cliche, but age really is just kind of a number because at almost 55, I am dramatically younger than uh, some of the young people that I meet. And that's because I lived in an environment where I got to be Peter Pan for 28 years. You know, I mean, wasn't forced to really grow up because at the end of the day, even though I had an incredibly responsible job, it was also a shitload of fun, you know. Uh huh. And a lot of adults, uh, I just said this recently, uh, are forgetting to have fun these days. Yeah. And I, during COVID, it was so, it, it really was a polarizing moment in history where we got to see, you know, we may, may or may not make it through this. And what do we want to do with it on the other side, you know, and have fun. Sure. I just want to, I just was in Arizona skipping through the mountains with my nephew for no other reason than it was fucking fun. Yeah. And it's proof you will stay younger by having fun all the time and just being a kid. Oh, yeah. You know, it was kind and of funny because when COVID hit, one of the things that I kind of realized and noticed was because I'd had so long in the sport and I'd had so much fun, other than the fact that, uh, you know, you're not drawing a paycheck and you're bored. All these people are like, oh, my God, all these things that I would do if and all I'm doing is sitting on the couch going, actually, this is kind of a nice break because <laughs> I've been I've been charging hard for so fucking long. I like being on the balcony in my underwear drinking Patron at 10 o'clock in the morning. This is kind of nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that that's true. Skydiving on your side and on my side, I lived in a little cabin in the woods, mm. I literally. And um, with surrounded by cows and and it, I didn't even know COVID was really going on. It was so much different for me because I lived in, you know, Dade City, Florida, in the middle of nowhere. Life basically just continued on for me. I stayed in the woods. I'm a hunter. So I was pretty much doing the same sports sure. and th always been involved in. Oh, God, no. I was locked in my apartment with my then um, brand new live-in girlfriend, now wife, but then brand new live-in girlfriend. To the, I mean, we were locked into the point where you had to get permission from the cops to go to the supermarket. And at 7 o'clock every night, people are rattling pots and pans to thank the, the workers for helping and all that. Like, we were locked down. That is a unique way to start a relationship. And if it makes it, it made it through that, you guys are good forever. That's exactly what we, that's why I proposed. Cause we came out of the <laughs> lockdown and I went, both of us still have all our parts and we're not dead. Um, clearly this works. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it was sad during the time there was like more murders and domestic violence and all this kind of stuff. And I think a lot of it sadly goes back people forgot how to just have fun. Like at some point as adults, we just decided, okay, now it's time to be serious about sure. everything. Sure. You got to 
out and just go have fun every I Damn. guess I mean I I I absolutely understand what you're saying but I never did that. I mean I for as much as I want to say that I've been a, a a you know a good adult that's been a you know a productive member of society I went from the strip club to a fucking airplane. I mean I I kind of have never been an adult and I I relish that fact. So it makes those days when I actually have to do an honest day's work or I actually have to do something I don't want to do. All I have to do is think, come on, asshole, for a very long time now, you've not had to do anything you didn't want to do. So shut up and do it. Yeah. 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 And we can totally address the, uh, the, the stripper part of it. Um, yeah, we definitely are uniquely – uh related in that we I was gonna <laughs> I say to, I used to be a stripper I think that's what we do <laughs> Florida College I, I just think that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> I was not going to talk shit about Florida I wasn't gonna say a thing about Florida you brought it up <laughs> I mean, totally can. you know it's 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 funny and I think you might understand this coping with fear and skydiving was easier for me because I had to take my fucking pants off in public. And yes. if if you have never done that, none of you, nobody listening has a fucking clue what real fear is like. <laughs> yes. The first time you have to be half naked on stage and it's just you. And you got to be up there for two or three songs. There is. Going, what the hell am I doing yep. right now? Yeah. But I'm making thousand dollars a day and i'm 21 years old so yep, yep. hey i mean that, the money's right that's how old i was when i started it's and it was ridiculous and you're i mean i don't know about you but I, I i did it for a very long time and there was not one day that went by that i didn't think it was a complete joke but i it laughed is. oh i <laughs> laughed all the way to the bank i'm like are you kidding me i have an average build i'm an average dancer i'm i'm just willing to do this like i'm just the <laughs> asshole that's willing to do it yeah, I feel like that right now in this moment. I'm just the asshole that's the the, the baby skydiver that's willing to do it. Yeah, but it but, really is. I mean, honestly, all jokes aside, I think being able to overcome the insane fear and nervousness involved in taking on a, a bizarre profession like that really led a lot towards my being mm -hmm. able to cope with the overwhelming fear of learning to become a skydiver. Yeah, and and to your point, there was a time and I've just recently done this self-reflection of, of what then I used to be so confident. I used to be able to overcome fears and it really does go back to my days in the club where I was able to overcome that. And then I built this confidence that's hard to describe. Um, it's a lot different these days. It's not like it was back then, but, mm. um, and, and I was a bartender for 20 years and I had that confidence and somewhere along the way after my divorce and, you know, just not to sound like these midlife crisis things, but these things did happen and it sort of sucks your confidence and then it sucks your confidence again. And piece by piece, before you realize it, you're afraid to do normal shit that you used to do and inspire other people to do, or, sure. you know, every you're tough and you can handle these things and those. And then the next thing, you know, I'm living in a cabin in the woods by myself for a year and a half, completely isolated, like acting like an, an agoraphobe. Sure. And oh, so that was part of it. I needed to go and I needed to continue on and I needed to confront that. And I would want anybody new to it, regardless of your age to know that they're not alone. We all felt like that. And I am probably, I swear, I know I'm not unique. I'm not special, only uniquely special to me and myself, but I am the biggest chicken shit in the room mm -hmm. at any given It is simply because I force myself to confront that and keep going and find a way, even if you fuck it up, just make a choice and go. Sure. Well, and that's one of the things that, and, and I've said it before, and, and I just put a book out not that long ago based all about fear and, and uh, specifically when it comes to overcoming a fear and then finding at the other side of that, that not only did you overcome that fear, but that you had fun doing it. There's nothing you, you, you there, there wouldn't be the 
biggest shot of fucking heroin, the highest high class, and there's nothing that would compare to completing something that you were terrified to do and you had fun doing it anyway. And you get to the backside of that and you really are a different person. I mean, it's almost an instantaneous change. You land and go, something's fucking different. It doesn't mean you're not going to be scared the next time. It just means you're, you're just that slight bit more prepared to handle that fear the next time and a little bit more the next time and it's a snowball effect it really is it's like training a muscle it's yes. like training something else and continuing on to do it and i did read the book and the book was phenomenal uh oh, you I did, did the- so, so it was, it was you <laughs> yeah, <thank> you. <laughs> it was me it was oh. definitely and then I thought, that's how this started. I thought, I'm the only person that did that. Wait a minute. If it's a small enough pool, I should just ask, talk, tell them my story and maybe go on the show. And I don't know where I got the audacity idea to do it, but. Um, no, that's but that's exactly what I want. It really is. And and uh, I mean, the biggest point to that book was, although I pointed to the physiology behind it and the psychology behind it, the most important points made in that book weren't made by me. They were made by the professionals, guys like Jeff Provenzano and Maxine Tate and these people that have been doing it their whole lives that are willing to express to the people just starting out that, hey, I was scared doing this, and this is what I've been doing for 20, 30 years, 30,000 skydives, you know, and and I started out scared. And that's a lesson that people, uh, they underestimate how impactful that really is. It's hugely impactful. And hearing somebody that you look up to and you hear their story and and how successful and how they got past it now, um, that my first few jumps, I just thought, but they're different than me. Like (laughs) they're, they're somehow geared for this and I'm not sure. And none of that's true. No, I mean, that's true. You, um, what's his name? I'm, I'm so bad at names and I don't mean to be disrespectful in that way. There's a canopy, the canopy pilot you had on that, um, it discusses how he, he was the most terrified to ever start his AFF to do his first jumps. And I remember thinking, how the hell did he get there? How how did he go from the other? And how do I crack this code and do it myself? Yep. Well, I remember reading years and years back, um, it was, I don't know, it was a study done or a doctor had hypothesized that people that uh, were involved in extreme sports were just less susceptible to the fear factor because they had lower levels of this or that or the other thing. And I was terribly insulted by that because I'm like, wait a second, I was scared shitless. And it wasn't that I did this because I wasn't scared. It's I was terrified and I did it anyway. So fuck you and your hypothesis. It was really insulting to me because it kind of diminished um, the battle that I had to make myself do that. You know, so I don't. I don't buy any of that shit. It's all how you feel, whether or not you're scared or you're intimidated and you being able to push through and finding out that other people dealt with that, especially when they're the people that are at the top of the game. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones where you're like, oh, shit, that's because otherwise you run around with imposter syndrome, right? You're like, mm-hmm. oh, no, I'm just faking my way through this. Everybody else is a badass, but I'm just completely full of shit. And then at some point you realize, oh, no, we're all just full of shit. We're just doing it. <laughs> that is so true and such a good point because that is probably – it's almost like your mind is making excuses for you to quit when yeah. you feel – when you think, uh, oh, it's just not me and it, it's a confidence issue. No, it's just you're full of shit. You're, yep. Everyone's afraid. The only thing that makes a difference is not quitting. Yep. Quitting. You can't quit because it's so much worse. I mean, I'm sure if you had a truly dangerous student that just was not getting it and doing dangerous, crazy shit, somebody would say something. But chances are whoever it is 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 not that's not just not the case well the the truly crazy dangerous stupid people have a way of weeding themselves out of skydiving one way or another (laughs) yeah one person get chewed out and and that was truly because he wasn't taking anything seriously and so you know presentation 
And there's a number of things, you know, I mean, you'll see that kind of thing. And uh, first off, you don't ever want to see anybody get hurt in the sport. Um, And second off, for a more egotistical reason, we as skydivers don't want anybody to give us a bad name. Like, yeah, we already fight the reputation, although not as much these days because it's become so professional. But especially back in the day, um, I would see you know, back in the, the very beginnings of, of YouTube and, and, uh, the internet and all that stuff. Um, it was Travis Pastrana had done his rigless jump and yeah. I'd been vocal about it before. I, I hated that jump. I was, I was, I really thought it was the stupidest thing I'd ever seen because it was also at a time when as a professional skydiver, you were already fighting the stereotype that you were just some adrenaline junkie fucked up in the head person. And I'm like, but you you're just making it look worse. You know, that's not how skydiving is. They're not seeing the fucking gear checks on the ground. They're not seeing me do 20 handles checks on the plane, every load (laughs) all the way up and all these things that go into it. I'm like, that's just a bad representation of the sport. So now it's, it's a lot better because the professionalism has stepped up and, and Travis, if you've listened to this, I like your other shit, but I fucking hated that jump. (laughs) Yeah, we all saw it. And and I had back when I remember that when he first did it and it did, because that was back when I was like, yeah, these are crazy fuckers. Why yes. would anyone? Do that? And it just lends itself to that stigma that there's not really the level of professionalism going on. And, and even, you know, people looking out for each other, you know, in, in the loading area, on your way to the loading area, on the plane, um, how serious everyone takes it and is constantly checking out for whether it's your student or somebody else's student or just your buddy that you're jumping with. Yep. Every so seriously. And it's impressive to see the shift now that I've gone back because I'm a nerd. And so I went back and I kind of studied the history, the, the people, the, and everything that went into it to watch its progression so that I wouldn't be absolutely completely full of shit forever. But, um, I had a newfound respect for it. I mean, that it was wild. Um, not so much because just the the people, but in what you guys were jumping and the equipment you have, and then how much, yeah, the progression and these incredible manufacturers and and people far smarter uh, are doing. Yeah. Uh, that is, um, it's impressive. It's impressive. Sure. Yeah, well, and and for me as well, I mean, watching the transition over the past 28 or so years of the uh, the equipment and and how much uh, better it's gotten and and uh, but even me, I'm 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 of a generation that's reaping the rewards of the people that were truly out of their fucking minds, you know, and and this is my favorite part about this sport is uh, very early on in the sport. I got to meet and jump with a guy by the name of Lou Sanborn and shoot a video of Lou Sanborn. And you probably won't know the name, but you'll understand the designation. He's licensed D one. Okay. That's the beginning of modern skydiving, right? That's that's the first generation. This is the first guy ever to hold a D license in the USPA. And I, with license D24191, got to jump with and shoot a video of this guy. Holy mm-hmm. shit. In what yeah. other sport do the 24,000th person in line get to hang out with the first one? This is the only sport I know of. It- it's the only sport I know of. Yeah. It's the only I know of. And I even, so I, uh, in another one of my endeavors, I decided to take up jujitsu and it was cool. It was fun. Um, super humble people, but I found out very quickly. You talk about getting humbled. <laughs> hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I was training with one of the best gyms. Uh, this guy was one of the first four people that um, the Gracie's gave a black belt too. So, uh, it was, it was humbling, but it hurt my neck and I couldn't continue doing it. 
It's another <laughs> thing we have in common because I was training in a Gracie gym in Dubai and um, uh, a rock star who I highly recommend. If you want to know the history of skydiving, look up uh, Omar Al-Hijalan. He's been on the show a few times. He, along with a guy by the name of Olaf Zipser, are kind of the fathers of free flying. Um, but uh, Omar is a good friend of mine, and he took me to this um, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu gym in Dubai, and I had a lot of fun with it. And uh, humbling, but by the time you've been jumping as long as I have, I'm used to being getting humbled. Um, but yeah. uh, but the first time I felt what they can do to my neck, I went, oh, fuck, man, that's that's the end of that. But it was really, really fun. It was thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyable. And you're right. It's the same thing. It's a high stress environment where you have to learn to take a step back while the shit is hitting the fan think about what you need to do and then execute it. And so it's very similar mentally. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And to your point that that is basically, uh, well, you're not falling um, guy, but, but you certainly have a guy when, when they're explaining to you different moves and you're drilling them and you're drilling them. And then when you go to roll with somebody, all of a sudden time slows down yep. and you're actually able to do something. I know that, I, I haven't gotten to experience all the malfunctions I will experience in my life, but I I, I loved watching Friday freak out. Some of the <laughs> other events were like, dude, why are you watching that? And I'm like, why are you not watching this? Yep. Yep. <laughs> Cause they're not dead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like they're okay. Yeah. They're trying to show you something and it, it's not replacing your training, but it get, does, it gave me confidence sure. more confidence. No. Okay. The one thing all these guys have in common is that nobody gave up and quit. Cause like, that's it. You're not, and so they kept. And there's going. a, uh, there's actually a quote, uh, um, in the book from one of the other jumpers that says, uh, um, keep fighting until your goggles fill with blood. Yeah. Yeah. Which is morbid as fuck, but it's true. But you just don't give up. Don't give up and don't freak out. Don't actually freak out. Yeah, no, well, so you can you can kind of bookmark it when something's going wrong in the sky. And I did the same thing when I was flying planes. You you're able to go, oh fuck, I'm in a situation. Let me put a bookmark in this. I'm gonna deal with it. I'm gonna get on the ground, then I'm gonna open it to that bookmark, and then I'm gonna shit my pants. Cause I don't yeah. get to I don't get to shit my pants now because I have things to do. But <laughs> I'm going to lose my shit on the ground when I remember this. And I still, to this day, and, and you'll have it, you'll, you'll have jumps that you'll look back on and go, <laughs> you'll, you'll get those cold shivers all the way down the line, whether it be something that just went wrong or whether it was a mistake that you made. And those are the ones that really haunt you when, yeah. when you made the mistake and you're like, Oh, I can't believe I did that. But it's those mistakes that keep you safe the next time and keep you from making those same stupid blunders that could get you killed. Absolutely. Even something as simple as uh, my very first jump, I was one of those that failed because I didn't pull and I didn't pull because I didn't know I couldn't find it. I yep. couldn't find it. I was flying like air trash. And thank God enough can't be said for um AFFIs because they're right there and th they took care of me but I remember being terrified because I thought what if they had turned loose in me I, what if I never found it and I got this huge case of the what ifs and so sure. I had to go drawing board I ended up going to the tunnel um which saved me from having to repeat everything 50 times um but I was the weird person. Uh, there was a group of us students and I was the weird one who was looking forward to some sort of malfunction because I wanted to know how I would respond. Sure. And um, it was just line twist. And I think it was my second jump. And I was stoked. I came back and I was like, guess what? Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. I, I got to experience it. And and I know that I everything slowed down. I, I grabbed my risers, did what I was ta taught to do, and everything was fine. Yep. Yeah, I had but my first uh, my first cutaway at twenty five jumps, and I landed shook. You know, because I mean, they tell you it could happen, but somewhere in the back of your mind, you're like, mm, yeah, but not me. And then it happens, and you're like, oh shit. 
And I remember um, a guy by the name of Mike Skeffington, another rock star from back in the day, said the coolest thing ever because he had thousands of jumps at that point. So he was like on God level to me at that point. And uh, uh, I'm I'm just kind of calming down from the malfunction. And he's all, you know something I don't know. And I'm like, what? He's like, you know something I don't know. You know you can pull the handles. I've never had to. And oh. Oh, yeah. And instantly I, I was so grateful for this fucked up jump that literally seconds before was making me question whether or not I wanted to continue with the jump. And instantly I'm like, but wait, he's right. I just answered the scariest question. I know how I can pull the hand. I can make myself do the one thing I didn't want to do because there's only two things in skydiving, right? The, the one thing you really don't want to do is hit the ground going too fast. The other thing you don't want to do is have to pull those two fucking handles. Yeah. It's, it's scary. It is. And as soon as you realize I can pull those handles, well, then you just kind of, for the most part, got rid of that other worry, which is hitting the ground too hard because you know how to pull those fucking handles. It's a big thing. Yeah. And, uh, and for new skydivers, like the, I think the thing that, and who am I, but. I think what what we're told is, you know, learning that muscle memory. And I think for me, that actually helps me have more confidence. And I do it ad nauseum, like oh, yeah. constant, because I know me and I don't want to panic. And, and, and then all of a sudden I'm not thinking, I want my body to just think for me. Sure. Well, it's it's funny because uh, uh, I'm not a religious person, but if you were a religious person and you saw me on the airplane, you'd think I was doing the sign of the cross. I do so many handles checks. <laughs> It's just, wait a second, he does the sign of the cross by grabbing his ass? But, yeah. <laughs> but seriously, it's, you know, it, it becomes uh, 20 times in a load. It's almost a twitch. It's a, uh, yep, primary, okay, there we go. And especially as a tandem instructor, you're just mentally going through it. And, and I had, especially as a sport jumper, I would have, okay, I throw the parachute, okay, it worked. I throw the parachute, it worked, but it's a malfunction, pull the handles. I throw the parachute, I don't feel anything, I do the shoulder thing, <laughs> shit, that, that, and I run through them on the plane almost without even thinking about it. So that I've had, what have I had, five or six malfunctions now um, that were cutaways, and, and really, other than the first one, they were all academic. It was just, a, okay, it's time to do this. Hey, the 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 lessons and the program and all of it, it works. I mean, yep. it, it, it definitely works. And as students, we, we have to pay attention to them and actually take it seriously and do it over and over and over again. And I, and I learned it in that moment and it was a cool moment for me. And it actually built more confidence in me instead of scaring me, sure. landing on the, scared the shit out of me. And it's the reason I cannot <laughs> land on target today because I keep overshooting it because I'm so scared I'm going to go over the airport and hit it again. Yeah, but again, it's those lessons learned, right? It's just, yep. it'll keep coming. So as we as we wrap things up, um, first off, I'm jealous because you're kind of in the sweet spot of skydiving. Like, it's all in front of you and there's so many new things to learn and like every direction is an option. And cool uh, with the sport is that it will remain an option. Through You can always go any direction you want, but right now, Everything is just so shiny and so cool. So being where you're at, somebody's listening. They're they're not a jumper yet. They're on the beginner skydiving forum. They listen to the podcast to hear in. Um, if they want to come out to Zephyr Hills and they want to meet you and hear how you did it, or somebody at Zephyr Hills wants to hook up and do some fun jumps, or there's a neurosurgeon out there that thinks he can fix your neck. <laughs> How can they find you online? Where do they, where do they reach out to you? How can they meet you? I'm on Facebook as Candace Renee. I'm on Instagram um, under Cracker Candy because, of course, I am. Um, and I'm at the zone <laughs> all the time. So Cracker I'm, Candy. Yes. <laughs> I would dive deeper into that, but we don't have time. We're at the end of the show. <laughs> Candace, I'll tell you what, not only can I thank you so much for taking the time this morning to sit down and talk to me, but especially for reaching out and wanting to share your story as a beginning skydiver and giving me shit for not having uh, old people on. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> yeah, awesome. This was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Well, there you have it. Another episode of the Lunatic Fringe Podcast brought to you as always by... Well, wait. Not as always, actually. Brought to you now by Gyro. Formerly known as NZ Aerosports, you'll head to gyro.com for their next level line of canopies. By Pussfoot, the Extreme Sports Collective. Head over to pussfoot.com to check it out. By Summit Parachute Systems, check out summitparachutesystems.com to talk to Jarrett Martin and the gang about kick-ass pilot rigs, rigging courses, and more. By Flyaway Indoor Skydiving, go to flyawaytn.com and check out all the cutting-edge stuff to come. By Pure Spectrum CBD, head to purespectrumcbd.com to check out their wide range of CBD products. And as for us, head to the lunaticfringepodcast.com to listen to any of the hundreds of episodes currently available, hit the link for our YouTube channel, pick up your copy of the Lunatic Fringe book or The Accidental Stripper, and get a sneak peek at upcoming guests. Once again, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Let's go.